What I've been asked to talk to you about is this title, The Critical Role the Scientist Plays in the Commercialization of IP. There's lots of myths about this. Lots of myths about what a scientist, or the role that a scientist plays or doesn't play in relation to the commercialization of IP. Sometimes, some of the things that are said in relation to the contribution the scientists make in commercialization is not a, a flattering one, it's a perspective one. So we're gonna set the record straight in relation to some of these things. Along the way though, some things before we get into the more, uh, the more controversial things, we're gonna talk about what commercialization is and why we do it and what the, the, the role of the scientist is in, the, in that commercialization, why it's a critical role. And then we'll end up talking about some things that might be useful for the scientists to know when, uh, when thinking about commercialization. First of all, the obvious, why do we do research? Well, the obvious, we want to extend the boundaries of knowledge. We want to, stay, we want to extend the knowledge that the community has. As individuals, as scientists who as individuals, we do research because we want to be published. We want to be recognised by peers. We want our standing and our reputation to be enhanced. We want the standing and reputation of the institution that we work at to be enhanced as well. But more than that, we want to benefit the community. That's, at the end of the day, the reason why we do research. We want new products, new vaccines, new medicines, things that make sick people get better, things that improve the quality of life. That's what research in this field is all about. Why do we commercialise IP? Doing the research is just part of that. But why do we go further and say that we want to commercialise IP? Well, sometimes people think it's just about the money. It's not about the money at all. In fact, the money has almost nothing to do with it. Let's come back to that. What's commercialisation? Let's put a definition around that so that we know what we're talking about. Commercialisation is about doing deals. At one extreme, we have outcomes out of a laboratory. At the other extreme, we have products being made in a factory, put into boxes, those boxes being put into the back of the truck and being delivered into shops. In the middle, between those two things, there's a deal to be done. A deal is very often a, a license or a strategic alliance or a collaboration or something. But it's that deal, it's that deal that is the commercialization that we're talking about and that is going to be the focus of our comments for the next one hour. That's what commercialization is. It's the process of getting outcomes out of a laboratory and into the marketplace. It's what happens between innovators, like a research institute or a university, and companies in commerce. People with the financial capacity to take products into the marketplace, with the capacity to invest speculatively into getting research outcomes further along the development pathway, and then into, uh, into products that enter the marketplace, whether it's a licensee putting products, whether it's a venture capitalist investing in research. And the reason that we do it is for community benefit. That's the reason. Whether it's to make sick people get better, whether it's to vaccinate people so they don't get sick, whether it's to feed more people, whether it's to make the planet less ill than it presently is, that's the reason why research is done, to improve the world in some way. And this really is the reason that those involved in commercialization get involved. When we deal, just here I mentioned the Gardasil deal, when we did the Gardasil deal some years ago now, the product's been in the marketplace since 1996, when we did that deal we all had a feeling, the group of us, the team that worked on the deal, we all had a feeling that something different about this deal. The difference was that we had this feeling that this really got, was going to be a product that would go into the marketplace. We started thinking about the implications of this. The implications were going to be that women would be vaccinated against papillomavirus and would not get cervical cancer and therefore would not die. And that realisation amongst the group of us after the deal was done and after we were cheering one another and, uh, and having a, a celebratory drink, it occurred to us that this deal was a little bit different. Many of the other deals that we'd already done where perhaps the prospect of a product in the marketplace was a bit more elusive, well, it didn't seem elusive for that deal. For that deal, it wasn't elusive at all. And that was the motivation for what we did as commercialisers, as people involved in the commercialisation process as well as the scientists. When the scientists were with us, when we were all together, this was the reason why we did what we did. Whether a scientist doing science or whether it was commercialisers commercialising, it was because something would come out of the, the work that we did that would be beneficial to other people. So 
it's only a small part that each of us individually played, but it's a part that we all, each of us felt very good about. So that's why we commercialise, whether it's to play a part in bringing a new medicine into the marketplace or to contribute to economic benefits. And these economic benefits are not benefits that we should dismiss. Community benefits we've been talking about. Some of these other benefits we need to briefly mention. I'm not going to deal, dwell, dwell on them for, for too much. The community benefit, the community benefits of course because there's a product in the marketplace. What we've been talking about, deals are done, it's those deals that put products into the marketplace. We do a licensing deal, a university or a research institute is not going to have the capacity to, uh, to take the outcomes of research and create a product. They need to find a licensee to do that for them. A venture capitalist contributes by providing money to, f to fill the funding gap, the gap between when there's no more public sources of money and when there's lots of industry money. But between that, there's a funding gap where most projects die. Venture capitalists serve that need of being able to fund projects to ensure that they don't die. National economic benefits. If we succeed in getting a product into the marketplace, new industries are created, export earnings, imports that are, re that are replaced, increasing wealth upon which taxes are leveraged, taxes are levied and therefore enables um, public sources of money to increase as well. Lots of national economic benefits. Institutional benefits. If ICGEB makes a licensing deal and earns royalties, those royalties will fund more research. This is what relationships of industry partners can bring about. Having more uh, research dollars within which to do research, as well as having relationships of industry partners to facilitate all of that. But then as well, um, personal benefits to scientists. I don't know, what is the, what, what's the, uh, the situation in this institution in relation to sharing commercial benefits with scientists who invent? Um, in many, something like that? A third, a third, a third is very common amongst many research institutions where that's the ceiling. A third goes to the scientists that were the inventors, a third goes to their department or their, their lab or their school, a third goes to a university or to the institution. Um, so creating those, those wealth benefits uh, not to be dismissed either. Um, there are some scientists around driving red sports cars. I'm going to tell you about some of them in a little bit um, in a little while. Um, they get a third of the revenue because their innovation is what results in a, in a, in a product entering the marketplace and royalties or other financial benefits coming back. Some scientists have become so successful in uh, the, their commercialisation that they've become the benefactors of their own research institution. I know of some scientists who take all their prize money, they don't keep any of it. I mean, they're so wealthy from the work that they've, from the royalties that they receive another prize or another royalty check doesn't mean a lot to them. What they do instead is they donate it to the institutes which they now run. So they're basically funding their own research, doing the research that they choose with the staff that they choose and funding it all themselves. Some of them have even become venture capitalists. So once they've gone beyond their personal wealth, beyond funding their own institutes, they've now also combined together to create venture capital funds to invest in the research of others. And this has been driven by some of these very successful scientists. In other words, they've gone beyond just publications and the career advancement and peer recognition. They've achieved all of that. They've gone beyond all of that. Now, not only are they funding the research that they choose, the research that they want their institutes to do, but they're also funding the research of their colleagues in other places. Should a non-profit institution be concerned with money? Should an institution like this, like ICGEB, be concerned with money? I think that's a very misleading question. It's too basic a question. It's not a question about the money. It's instead a different question that we might consider asking ourselves. The question is about preserving the commercialization objective. So you might be forgiven for now saying, I oh, know he's going to say that we can't publish and that you've heard all that before and you might sigh and, and all of that. And some of the smiles on, on your faces indicate that that's a reasonable prediction. I'm not going to say that at all. Um, in fact, um, a little later I'm going to tell you that you must publish and that it's a critical contribution that you make <coughs> towards publication, but um, that's going to be later. For the moment, to the question, should a non-profit institution be concerned with money? Well, um, one answer is it isn't about the money, it's concerned of community benefit. The money is a side effect. In other words, 
we commercialise because we want to get a product like a vaccine into the marketplace. If it doesn't get to the marketplace, it means that people are going to be vaccinated. If it doesn't get into the marketplace, people who are not vaccinated are going to get sick. If we want people not to get sick and that community benefit to be achieved, we want the vaccine to be developed, the vaccine to enter the marketplace. And that means there has to be commercialisation. The community benefit isn't going to be achieved unless that commercialisation takes place. The money is a side effect, but the money is not a bad side effect. If one third of the income that comes through goes towards funding the labs here um, that the scientist is involved with, another one third goes more generally into funding the institution, and one third goes into the individual scientists whose innovation has been responsible for those financial benefits, that's not a bad side effect. But as I say, that's not the main reason why it's done. Anyway, at the end of the day, the message I'm trying to give you is that everyone's motivation, whether it's a scientist, whether it's an institution, whether it's commercialisers, whether it's venture capitalists, whether it's lawyers, the motivation isn't about the money, the motivation is what commercialisation achieves. What that achieves is outcomes of research benefiting people. That's why we do it. So it ticks all of these boxes. Products enter the marketplace, national economic benefits, economic benefits to an institution like ICGEB, more money to spend on research, as well as economic benefits of the scientists. That's not an illegitimate objective either. So what role do all of you play in this, that what we've been describing? Well, the first role is a very obvious role, so let's get it out of the way. You make inventions, you invent. A scientist invents and creates new intellectual property. There isn't going to be anything to commercialise, there isn't going to be any benefit to the community, there isn't anything going to be invented to improve the world in the way that we're describing if it isn't for that inventiveness that scientists create. Anyway, that's an obvious one. We all recognise it. Let's move on. The second role, the scientist publishes. Now, this is the very opposite to what you may have expected me to say. And the reason for that is that most scientists, in fact most people, still perceive that publication and commercialisation are on a collision course and that these two things are mutually exclusive and that they can't be achieved together. You may have always been told that you can't publish, you're not allowed to publish. Publishing destroys novelty. I had a client some years ago in, uh, in Australia, there is a, a collaboration called a Cooperative Research Centre. It's funded by government for seven years, for a period of seven years. And people's, people who contribute to CRCs are governments, research institutes, universities, private sector. A seven year collaboration involving about 50 or 60 scientists and it was a source of some pride to the CEO of that CRC that they were able to say that for seven years they had not one publication. Because this was, it was so important to them to achieve the commercialisation objective that it was a source of pride to them that they were so in tune of the commercialisation objective that they had no publications for seven years. Of course that misses the point. It wasn't a matter to be proud about because no publication means actually that they were thwarting their commercialisation objective. And now that's so is what we're going to be talking about for a few more slides. Um, publications actually promote the commercialisation objective. I'm going to show you how that's so. Sorry, we went backwards. Anyway, um, when a scientist presents a paper at a conference or when a scientist publishes in a journal, you get on the radar scope of pharmaceutical companies. Pharmaceutical companies read these publications, they go to these scientific meetings and they read and they listen to the presentations or they read the papers. And they may be silently watching what's going on, but they're nevertheless listening. They'll go to the next scientific meeting and they'll watch out for the scientists that they who had presented a paper on the last occasion and they'll go and seek them out and listen to their next paper. They'll go and read the next paper that they publish in the journal. They're silently watching what's going on and keeping a tabs on the science that is uh, as it's being progressed. And they'll engage the scientists in conversation. They'll go up and chat. They'll go and have a cup of coffee. They'll go and have a meal. They'll chat. They'll go and visit each other. They'll get to know each other. So what's going on? when? A pharmaceutical company is doing this? What's the purpose 
the pharmaceutical companies sending these people to these conferences, why do they have such armies of people doing nothing more than reading the academic literature, the scientific literature, to see what's going on? They want to know what research is taking place, where the exciting projects are that they might become interested in, so that they can judge what they might want to support and do a deal about. And every single deal that I've ever done in the pharmaceutical space has had its origin in what I've just described. With that exception, every single deal, the opportunity for the deal having been made, the commercialization deal, was a publication or a conference presentation, or a series of publications or a series of conference presentations. It wasn't a business manager going and knocking on the door of Pfizer or GSK. It was rather the scouts from Pfizer and GSK coming and knocking on our doors. Coming on knocking at our doors by going and talking to the scientists at scientific meetings and getting to know each other. Every single deal can be its origin, can be found in what I've just described. And that's the role the publications play. So rather than publications being perceived to be something that must be um, controlled or, or, uh, or something that must not take place or something that's on a collision course of commercialisation, it's in fact the very opposite. Publications are what create the opportunity for a deal to take place. The combination of publications and scientific presentations. So rather than scientists not publishing or being discouraged from publishing, as in the CR. I mentioned where there was a source of pride to them that for seven years they had no publications whatsoever. Rather than that being the case, it should be the very opposite. Scientists need to be encouraged to publish, need to be encouraged to make their presentations at conferences. It's how the opportunity for deals come about. It really is as simple as this. And as I say, every major pharmaceutical deal I've done has taken this pathway. There's an invention, there's a publication, that leads to a deal opportunity which deals to a license, the development of a product, and somebody who's sick gets better. And that's the lineal pathway that everything takes. But for the publication, that wouldn't happen. And it really does work that way. So as I say, sometimes these things are being perceived, are perceived as being on a collision course. The commercialization and publication are mutually exclusive. That they're on a collision course, the publication means disseminating and disseminating therefore means that you're going to adversely affect novelty and therefore not get a patent. And commercialisation is perceived as meaning to be uh, the need to keep something secret. And that's how things were perceived in that CRC that had no publications for seven years. That's far too simplistic a view and it's incorrect. These days everyone is much more sophisticated. Scientists, business managers, they know that in fact these things, um, publications, are going to assist the commercialisation objective. Scientists know that premature publication can damage the commercialisation objective being achieved. But business managers also know that publications are an essential part of commercialisation success. And that these things, far from being on a collision course, are in fact complementary to one another. And that's what people know these days. And therefore, these things need to be achieved together, not one or the other. Publication therefore needs to be seen to be part of a, a strategy to successfully commercialise. Publishing at the right time, in the right manner, in the right forum, all of these things together need to be managed. So that perception is quite wrong. The perception of things being on a collision course or being in conflict is, is not correct at all. David Baltimore is the president of Caltech. He has 386 peer review papers, 59,000 odd citations between 1983 and 2002. It's much more than that. Unfortunately, that's all I can get on the web is between those years. This, as, between, as between 83 and 2002, the seventh most cited scientist in the world. An academic leader, the seventh most cited scientist in the world, as well as the president of Caltech and a Nobel Prize winner and he has 17 patents to his name. He's achieved it. He's achieved academic excellence, academic leadership. You don't get much better than winning the Nobel Prize. And he's got 17 patents as well. Wasn't mutually exclusive for David Baltimore. 
Bert Vogelstein, Howard Hughes Medical Research Centre at John Hopkins University, 361 peer-reviewed papers, 106,000 citations. The most cited scientist in the world. And he is just so far out in front of number two, number two has about 68,000 citations. He has almost double the number of citations of the, as the second most cited scientist in the world. Bert Vogelstein has 120 patents to his name. The most cited scientist in the world has 120 patents to his name. How many people have uh, daughters or sisters or granddaughters that are under 25? Surely there's more. <laughs> um, and have they been jabbed with Gardasil? Well, if they haven't, they will be. I have two daughters, 20 and 18. They've both been jabbed with Gardasil. Gardasil, um, the papillomavirus vaccine invented by Ian Fraser. Ian Fraser, two, 2006 Australian of the Year. Uh, it, it, it's a national honour, but it's the, the highest honour that can be given to an Australian, is to be the Australian of the Year. He's won about 20 scientific awards and prizes. He's a professor of medicine at the University of Queensland. He has about 90, I don't know how many exactly, 90 peer-reviewed publications. Um, he's also founded a company, Corridon. It's attracted a lot of venture capital investment. Uh, I don't know how many patents. I've lost count. At least 20. It must be close to 20. It's, there, it's not up there, I don't think. Almost 20, 20 patents, I think. Um, and his, uh, his research has resulted in 600 million women, women so far in four years being vaccinated against cervical cancer. A certain percentage of those women are not going to die from cervical cancer. Amongst them, some of your relatives. Role number three. Scientists create deal opportunities. This might be a surprising thing to say. In 1999, there was a publication in the Journal of um, uh, Association of University Technology Managers. It's, a, um, it's, it's a, an association in North America that university tech transfer offices uh, are affiliated with. Where did the leads for licenses come from? And it was a study of 1,140 licenses from six American institutions, University of Florida, MIT, Oak Ridge, Oregon Health, Tulane, and University of Utah varied in scientific area, varied in, uh, in size. What did they find? They found that 56% of the leads for a license originated from a scientist. 56. Marketing efforts from the tech transfer office, 19%. Inquiry from a licensee, 10%. Leads from a research sponsor, 7%. The bottom two, the bottom range, was 0%. Scientists was, account, was responsible for more than half of the deal opportunities for a licence. More than half. Not the tech transfer office. The tech, tra tech transfer office do the deals. They shepherd the deals, they negotiate the deals, they make the deals happen, but they don't create the opportunity for the deal. That was created by the scientists. How do scientists do this? How do they create the opportunities or the leads for deals? One, they publish what we've just been talking about. By publishing, they get on the radar scope of the pharmaceutical industry. Biotech companies, they get on the radar scope of venture capitalists. They have former students who are in industry. I remember once we were sitting at a meeting, a scientist you know, describing the, the invention that he made. And uh, we asked him, you know, this was, this was something that was a bit unusual. and The commercialisation pathway wasn't quite obvious to anyone. Um, but at that meeting we asked him, can you, can you think of anyone who might be interested in this? He you know, shook his head, no, I can't think of anyone who may be interested in this. He rang back the next day. The next day he said, I'm having dinner with an old PhD student of mine at the end of the week. This is a student that had been one of his PhD students 15 years previously or 20 years previously, quite some time ago. And they had maintained contact with one another. Every once in a while they'd get together, they'd have dinner, they'd catch up. Um, they'd maintain contact with one another. PhD students and supervisors tend to do that. And, uh, and he said, I'll mention it to him and ask him if he has any ideas. So he had dinner with his PhD student on the Friday. He called the next Monday, the following week, 
and said, my PhD student's company would like a license. And that's with whom we did the deal. One of the most remunerative deals that was done by that university. In fact, I think the most remunerative deal that's ever been done by that university uh, was done because a scientist mentioned it to his PhD student. And his PhD student became the licensee, basically. Former colleagues. Sometimes there's mobility between academe and industry, some in some places more than in others. Um, and so people have these networks of people that they know or have known. Um, that's another opportunity for deals. Um, contract research. Industry wants to have relationship with people who are recognised as being the leaders in their field. And when industry wants to have research done by people who are leaders in their field, again, that extends the networks, extends who people know. Scientists that sit on scientific advisory boards. Scientists who have been successful in one invention tend to be sought out for the next invention. All of these are the ways that scientists create the opportunities for deals, for commercialisation to take place. Role number four. Scientists improve deal terms. What does that mean? Well, no one is more important to an industry partner than the scientist. An industry partner is going to make an enormous speculative investment in research to take place. The last person that the industry partner wants to upset is the scientist. The very last person to be upset is the scientist. So therefore, things like publications tend to be managed very well. But what do we mean by the scientists can improve deal terms? I'll tell you what happened and what has happened a number of times since we were able to successfully do this once. We've done it many times since. Um, and that is a royalty rate. A royalty rate for, there's two types, two main types of royalty rates. First royalty rate is for products that get sold. The second type of royalty rate is a royalty rate on license income. So for example, if I grant a license to you, you go and do, you put products into the marketplace, you pay me a royalty of say 7%. But now you go and do a sub-license to you, you pay a royalty to the licensee. Of the royalty you pay to the licensee, what percentage of that royalty should you pay me? In the pharmaceutical space, it can be 20, 25, 30, 35%, something like that. In other spaces, in other sectors, in the agricultural space, in agriculture biotechnology, it's not as mean as that. It can be much more significantly more generous than 20, 25%. In fact, we invariably get 50%. How do we get 50%? The way that we get 50% is that we try to negotiate that. When the industry partner doesn't want to pay 50%, you turn up to a negotiation and you try to persuade me that you're not going to pay 50%, that I'm being unreasonable in my expectations of 50%, what do I do? I bring the scientist to the next meeting. And the scientist doesn't need to say very much. He just needs to sit there and be attentive and watch what goes on. You're not going to want to upset him. And I say to my industry partner that we're making it, we have a partnership here. The partnership that we have is that we're each making a critical contribution to this, to this science. The contribution is that I'm providing the innovation, I'm providing the scientist, and you're providing the money. And I think that my contribution is significantly more valuable than yours, but I'm prepared to say that it's an equal value. So I think the 50% is a reasonable royalty for you to give me of the sub-license income. What do you think today about that? Do you disagree? <laughs> You're not going to want to upset your scientist. And, um, and you will always agree. And that's what I mean by scientists can improve the deal terms. And the scientists didn't need to do anything other than be there at the meeting. Because you're not going to want to upset the scientists. So commercialisation is something that very much is teamwork between the scientists and, uh, and business managers. Um, scientists can claim credit for creating the deal opportunities, they can even create credit for securing the best deal outcomes, for the best outcomes in the deal terms. But it's one of dependence. There isn't going to be anything to do deals with if scientists don't invent. Um, and of course, science isn't going to go anywhere unless there's commercialisation to take it into uh, a beneficial product. So they need each other. It's a relationship of dependence between them. Business managers therefore need to know what's important to scientists. 
and business managers need to uh, need to appreciate the scientists need to publish as the industry partners do. To veto publication is just not on in a million years. That used to be the case. That's very much you know what people used to say ten years ago, twenty years ago. That's that's what people used to say in the days of the CEO of the CRC with pride could announce in a public forum that we've had no publications for seven years and think that that was a positive thing to say. Those days are gone. Um, there's no such thing as publications being vetoed or, um, or not taking place. Um, so business managers appreciate this. They also appreciate the need for scientists to be kept informed of knowing what's going on. Um, scientists need to be aware of the progress in taking place in the business development of an opportunity and in the progress of a negotiation. Scientists also need to be warned when something is about to go wrong, when something bad might happen. There is no worse thing for me but for the industry partner to ring the scientist and say that I'm doing a bad job. The loss of confidence between the scientist and me will mean that the industry partner can now divide and conquer and get better deal terms as a result. So this relationship between me and the scientists is a very important one. The scientist needs to be warned by me when the scientist may get a phone call from the industry partner that will be critical of me. The fact that I've predicted that, predicted it accurately, I've told them what, they, what they're going to hear and have suggested how they might handle it, fills the scientist with confidence in me. It doesn't achieve what the industry partner set out to do. Sure, of course. In a managed way, yes. In a managed way, absolutely. I think, I think, I think in industry, there's more, much more controls of it than takes place outside. You don't see very much of it. Sorry. But let's look at it from our point of view. From our point of view, we want to get on the radar scope of companies. We want to publish to be able to get on their radar scope because we want deals to happen. We don't want, we don't want to keep it locked up inside the institution. What would be the point of that? Nor do we want it just to be a publication. We want it to be a publication that results in a deal opportunity, that results in a medicine that goes into the public, into the marketplace, that results in people getting jabbed and patients being swallowed and therefore sick people getting better. That's what we want. Companies take a much more uh, stringent view about these things because they don't have the same drivers as exists in a research organisation. So it, if, you have, if you're a superstar working for Pfizer, you think Pfizer's not going to accommodate the expectations of a superstar? They do. Mind you, some superstars in Pfizer can be can be bought by options, you but You're quite right in companies it's going to be done more stringently than outside, but uh, but if you're, if you're a superstar scientist in the company and you have all the options that you want, you already have... Uh, I could tell you some stories about some very wealthy people that I know with the options that they've received. <laughs> you already have all the wealth, you already have all the options. You want to publish something and if you don't, get the, if you don't have the ability to publish and you work for Pfizer and you have the option to go and go to MIT or go to Stanford or go to somewhere else, Pfizer doesn't want that to happen. What's Pfizer going to do? Pfizer's going to let you publish. At the end of the day, the scientists' rules on that, on that point. They may not be able to publish every time when they want, but I don't know a scientist who's never been able to publish what they want roughly when they want. <laughs> but every question they're answering, I cannot tell you. Yeah, well, they're, they're, they're much more handcuffed. But, but here in our environment, though, we want to publish. 
We want to publish in a managed way, but we want to publish. Yeah. Some useful things for scientists to know. Um, we're only very briefly, we're probably going to talk about joint ownership a little bit more than some of the others, but very briefly, the implications of joint ownership, the legal effect of some statements that may be made, work, starting work before contracts are signed, managing publications. We'll finish off talking about, about managing publications. How does joint ownership of IP arise? It arises because an agreement says that IP will be jointly owned, or it arises because there's no agreement at all and there's work taking place jointly and there's therefore joint inventorship. And some ways that this may arise, it may arise because there's a collaboration, it may arise because there's a collaboration with an agreement, it may arise because there's a collaboration with no agreements, nothing in writing. It could arise because material has been transferred, possession has been transferred from one institution to another. It might arise because there's students involved. Students are not employees, of course, so students are going to run their own IP. So a research collaboration, you have two scientists employed by two different institutions. They both contribute to an invention. Obviously, the two institutions are going to be joint owners. If we have uh, an MTA, we have material being transferred from one institution to another, it's not dissimilar. Either there's no MTA at all, which is a bad thing, or we have an MTA that's silent about ownership of IP, which might sometimes be okay, or we might have an MTA that deals with the issue of, of ownership and again may create a joint ownership situation. We can't avoid joint ownership arising. And of course very often joint ownership is thought of and regarded in a very positive way. People talk about it as a good thing. People talk about collaborating in a positive way. They talk about jointly contributing to the creation of IP, sharing the benefits jointly, sharing the burdens like patent costs jointly, makes people feel warm and in their tummies to talk about joint ownership. Joint ownership, however, is not a good thing. Um, we're going to talk about uh, joint ownership in different countries. Why do we need to know about joint ownership in different countries? Well, um, if we have joint ownership between two institutions, one in Italy, one in, uh, another one in Italy, do we need to worry about it? Well, the answer is yes, we do, because if we have two institutions collaborating and they're both in Italy, they may jointly own a patent in the United States. The regulation of that patent is going to be subject to US laws if there is no agreement that governs their joint ownership relationship. So two organisations in the same country need to know what the law about joint ownership is in the United States or wherever the patent may be located. And obviously, two organisations in two different countries need to know as well, not just their respective countries, but also every other country where their IP may exist. So let's ask ourselves two basic questions. Can one joint owner exploit a patent without the consent of the other and pay no royalty? The answer is yes. I used to be able to say the answer is yes in all countries, until in preparation for this talk, I had to inform myself what the answer is in South Africa. The answer is no, surprisingly, in South Africa. In South Africa, joint owners can't exploit. They first need consent or need a licence. But in every other country in the world, so far, that I've ever looked at, one joint owner is able to exploit without the consent of the other and without paying a royalty to the other. The implications of that we'll come back to. Yes? Are you saying that you're allowed to cheat? No. <laughs> no. The law protects cheating? No. Why? It's not cheating. If no, no. Let, let, me, let me give you this analogy. You and I own a house jointly. Okay? Because we jointly own this house, the law says that both of us are entitled to the benefit of this house. So you're entitled to live in the whole house, and I'm entitled to live in the whole house because we're joint owners. And I don't have to pay you rent because I'm a joint owner. It's not the case that we divide a line down the middle of the house, you have the side of the house that has the laundry. But I think the example is not quite. No. The question is whether you can rent the house and get all of it. Now that's the next slide. And, 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 I, and I get nothing. So no, 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 that's, that's, no, no, that's because no, if you no. do that, then it's obvious that I am half of owner. No, 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 no. We, we're, we're making, we're asking two questions. The first question is, can I use the patent? The second question is, can I license the patent? Two slides. Can you put the first question? So let's let's focus on the first question only, and we'll use our there rent. No royalty to the others. No, no. Hang on a moment. Hang on a moment. 
let's use the house example. You and I jointly own a house. If we jointly own a house, we're both entitled to live in the house, in the whole house. We don't put a line down the middle and you live in half and I live in half. We're both entitled to live in the whole house. Because I'm an owner, I don't have to pay you rent because I'm a joint owner. However, now let's ask the next question. Can a joint owner license the patent without the consent of the other? Can I r rent out the house as a joint owner? Well, the answer is no, I can't. Not without your consent. So what do you say it's the case? What do you mean by exploiting the exactly. house? Exactly. So so then, then we go to the first exploit, part. Exploit means... means paying royalty means that there is some, no. some income coming in. Otherwise, why do you say paying no royalty? So you that there is a royalty coming. Hang on a minute. That's right. That's so right. If you wanted to sell the vaccine in a pharmacy, then you have to pay the other. No, no, let's, let's come back. How can you use it without making a profit? No, I mean, no, you can use it on your house. You can that's use it on your That's why I think the Oscar is well. Kind of exploitation. Let's, 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 expo let's define exploitation. That's a good example because when I use the house, I also get a profit. But how can I use a patent without getting, using a patent without getting a profit? A profit. It's two different things. Whether, uh, whether the answer is the answer you wanted or not, it is, the, it is the answer. And it's because you're not comfortable about it, and you're not. And it's because you're not comfortable about it that you need to be aware of the implications of it and why, in fact, we're talking about it. Because you have a sense that something is not right and something is wrong, and you're right. You're quite correct. And it's the reason that you feel uncomfortable about this is why you need to be aware and why, in fact, we need to manage it. Because the law is, in fact, correct that the law says if we jointly own a patent, then it means I can make a product with this patent, I can put that product in the marketplace, and I don't have to pay you, the other joint owner, a royalty. And you can as well. You can go and put a product in the marketplace and you can sell it, and you don't have to pay me a royalty either, because that's what the law is in each of these countries, other than South Africa. But you as the owner are commercializing the patent. That's right. That's right. Should I inform you that I'm using my right on the patent? No need. No, not even no need. Or the laws in each of these countries say, if I'm an owner, I am entitled to enjoy the benefits of ownership without encumbrance and without having to pay a royalty to the other joint owner. I should, I must produce what the patent is. No, it doesn't oblige you to produce. So but the, the reason that you feel that this isn't just is the very reason why you need to know that this consequence of joint ownership is there. Because this comes as a surprise to people that joint, see, joint ownership is, is thought of as being a positive good thing, whereas in fact it's not. No, it's not. It's not a good thing. Joint ownership is in fact a bad thing because if I am a company and you are a research organisation, and you have agreed to give me joint ownership of a patent, what does that mean? That means that I can say, thank you very much, I will now go and produce this product into the marketplace, I will sell it, and I don't need your permission, and I don't need to pay you a royalty. And you may not like it, but that's too bad. Okay. And that's why joint ownership... The law, the law grants you the ability to the cheat well, it's, it's not cheating because the law, says, the law says that if you are an owner, you are entitled to the benefits of ownership. So all I am doing as an owner is exercising the benefits of ownership. Unless there is an agreement. Unless there is an agreement that changes that. Precisely. This is an important qualifier. Unless there is an agreement that changes this legal effect. But now let's look at the next question. Because... The next question is now different. Can a joint owner grant a license without the consent of the other? In the United States, the answer is yes. In every other country, the answer is no. So let's, let's just now recap and just work out what the implications of this are. I'm a, I'm a company. I'm a Pfizer. I'm a Merck. I'm a GSK, whatever. Your ICGUB. I come along and I woo you with the promise of lots of research dollars. And I say to you, and of course, you know, 
will jointly own the patent, we'll jointly own the research outcomes. And you are, of course, saying, thinking, well, that's not unreasonable. Yeah, of course we should jointly own. So you concede joint ownership. Because you concede joint ownership, let's see what the outcome is. I, as a company, can now exploit that patent anywhere in the world. I don't need your permission and I don't need to pay you a royalty. You, however, cannot. You are entitled to as a matter of law, but ICGUB cannot, does not have the infrastructure to become a commercial company. It would never get the sanction administratively to become a commercial company to construct a manufacturing plant to make products to create distribution networks, to put a product in the marketplace. That'll never happen. It doesn't have the capacity to do that, nor would it ever get the sanction to do that. So the result of joint ownership is that either company can enjoy the benefits of ownership. You, however, cannot. So you may think, ah, oh, but I can license. Well, no, you can't. You can't grant a license anywhere in the world without my permission. Am I going to give you permission? No. Why would I give you permission? All that would do would be to create a competitor. Yeah, but Why would I? For the benefits of, the, of humanity, all the things that you say very idealistic that you said at the beginning. It's good, it's good for the community. So all these things that you said at the beginning have to be seen in another light. Then, huh? but let's when look. You put but money at the bottom. I think that money was at the top. Maybe no, no, but let's put the let's top. put these things as a package, though. There's a few things as a package, though. I don't, I don't think, I mean, this is a personal view. I, don't, I, I think the community benefit is what drives us. However, I don't think it's fair for a company like Pfizer or GSK to get all the economic benefits and for none of the economic benefits that come back to the developer of the IP. I think the equitable thing is for the economic benefits to be shared in an equitable way as well as achieving the community benefit. That's what I think. No, the, the he is doing it for the good of the stockholders. Okay. You know, yeah. so he is doing it for the good of the stockholders. That's what his job is. Precisely. Which is why when GSK comes along and says, or Pfizer or Merck comes along and says, let's joint own, let's jointly own the patents. But the number of the stockholders is far less than the number of people who actually could benefit from the product. Which is why we need things to be equitable at the end of the day. I mean, apart from achieving the community benefit, it should be done in an equitable way as well. Anyway. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah? May. Sure. In the Martina's comment before is quite important. Uh, this is the joint, what happens with a joint owned patent without a specific agreement. Precisely. The exploitation is regulated. Precisely. The Precisely. And I think that the, the message that we have to to get is that whenever we own, jointly own an IP, we need to regulate that ownership in writing. Precisely, precisely. Because when it is regulated in writing, then there is the opportunity to achieve that equitable benefit that we're talking about. In, in whatever managed way is appropriate, it is appropriate as the negotiated outcome on the occasion. Yeah. Sorry, can you strong arm the company at least? Strong arm the company. Okay, so they you signed this stupid agreement and we are a joint owner. They commercialize a drug. It goes through all the regulatory processes, it's on the market. Yeah. Right. It's on the market in all of these countries. And can't I turn around in the United States at least and be licensed? Look, you can. That's theoretically possible, but um, and there's probably. Do you think that GSK or Merck knows this? And that they are going to do what they can to protect their biggest market? That's, that's so, and that's why, for them, what's more important is to have joint ownership. Because as joint owners, they will know that they can do it. They will know that you can't do it anywhere else in the world. They will also know. Mm. And I sit there and I'm pretending to be pissed off the 
whole time they put this thing through cl clinical trials, and I don't know how many hundreds of millions of dollars it's going to cost them. Right? There's a couple of practical things that we need to consider as well. Theoretically, Hang on a moment. What and what would be the objective of saying that? Is the objective right, saying that joint ownership is that is that are we trying to say that joint that, you know, because the United States is sitting there saying yeah. that I can license that without the consent of the other person, both Yeah. It means that they it means that it, it's harder for GSK or Merck or somebody else to come along and basically screw the institution or screw the science. Because hmm. they have to Okay, let's just work. Let's just work it through. If we were to agree to joint ownership, the outcome is that we can't license anybody else. The we might be able theoretically to license somebody in the United States only for the North American market, only for the United States market, nowhere else, which is the biggest, forty-two percent of the globe. Quite true. However, what's the likelihood of us being able to actually achieve that? That, that's one question. Let's park it. No, hang on. Let's let's. If the drug is already through clinical trials, I think it's pretty easy. Yeah, but you see, that, it's not going to get that far. Yeah, it's not going to quite get that far because there's a whole lot of other things, a whole lot of other dynamics that are taking place. The other dynamics that are taking place is that they've probably got a, an option to negotiate or write a first refusal. As joint ownership, what they've really achieved is they've created a weak bargaining position for ICGUB or for. Yeah, that's what they've achieved. Therefore, what we're trying to protect is preserving our position, not to have it weakened. Joint ownership weakens the position. You know, saying theoretically we can license the United States doesn't necessarily get a good outcome for us because all those other things that are taking place are operating to prevent that. Protection of data, the operation of rights of first refusal. At the end of the day, the, que the, the question is this, is joint ownership a good thing? The answer is that joint ownership for a, a, a comparatively weak organisation like a research institution or a small company is not a good thing. It puts them into a weak position. That's the outcome of joint ownership. And that's the message I'm trying to give, that Talking about things jointly normally has connotations that makes people feel good, makes people feel positive about sharing, makes people feel good about positive, it makes people feel good about sharing the outcomes and sharing burdens and sharing things together. The concept of sharing is a positive one. In the context of intellectual property, sharing is not because of the way domestic laws operate in countries throughout the world. Whether we're talking about exploitation or licensing, the rules in different countries has an outcome. The outcome is that, as a rule, the weaker organisation, the research organisation, is going to be worse off. So joint ownership is not something to be conceded. Joint ownership has an impact that will result in a weakened position for a research organisation. So the important point which has been reinforced is, these things are best recorded in writing, intentionally. If they're to be conceded, and sometimes they must be conceded. Sometimes they must be conceded because if, there's, if there is inventorship taking place from institutions, then you can't avoid joint ownership. The answer is to manage the way that joint ownership works. Not to concede it because it sounds good, but to intentionally agree on joint ownership and then manage what those outcomes are and how people are going to, um, what their respective obligations to one another arising from those joint ownership relationships are. Very quickly, we'll cover off on these remaining ones, noticing the time. Statements in negotiation. Scientists can be very passionate and therefore very generous in the things that they say. Sometimes saying things in a very, uh, in an overly enthusiastic way or an overly optimistic way. There are laws in, in all countries that are members of the World Trade Organization, and those laws operate to have consequences attaching to statements that may be too generous. In the United States, 
only by way of example, all member countries of the World Trade Organization have similar domestic laws. The wording may be different, but the effect is, is the same. Unfair or deceptive acts or practices affecting commerce hereby declared unlawful. It's very broad, very broadly framed. And some of the implications are that people can sue each other for damages. People can have contracts set aside. People can have injunctions issued to stop things from happening. I'll give you an example. A researcher who believed that they'd made a transgenic plant. Lab book results show that the plant was transgenic and as a result of being transgenic would, be, would produce more voluminous fruit. Um, on the basis of that, an investor invested $3 million. They didn't keep the plants. The, the plants to be maintained in the greenhouse and everything else would have been expensive. There was no need for that, so the plants were destroyed to save the cost of maintaining them. Um, they couldn't produce the transgenic plants again. Just couldn't do it. Isn't that Sorry? Isn't that very good no, well, there's lots of there were lots of questions, lots of issues. I want, don't want I don't want to get into it all, but no one uh, doubts the honesty of the researcher. Um, I think I think it was a question of the particular types of tests that were done were not the most robust tests. The southern blot, northern blot analysis, different types of tests, some less reliable than others. Not the most robust tests were done. And there was no question that there was no dishonesty involved, but nevertheless, there was what was technically misleading conduct, deceptive conduct. Okay, I'm glad that you brought this up because I think to be uh, completely uh, transparent to the people who may not know this, I'm sure you know. You brought David Baltimore as an example. I was in the States when David Baltimore was investigated for scientific fraud in the middle of the 80s. Really? As you know. yeah, I didn't you know, know that. I didn't know that. He was found guilty by NIH for wrongful doing, and he got out of it. His Nobel Prize was almost most pulled, and he got out of the hook by saying that he, he recognized his, uh, his guilty by saying that he forgot to properly supervise a student who actually faked data. Uh, there was a very, very long uh, uh, story on, on science and nature for, for months after this. Afterwards, when he was, he was interviewed, he said it was under pressure to make a deal with the company. So uh, all this, as I said before, all this uh, idealistic thing that uh, you know, science is done for, uh, you know, for the good of mankind, I have a little bit more, uh, I'd say, uh, realistic view. Uh, I think that the, the real mover of all of this is personal, personal profit. And, uh, and, and uh, also, well, I mean, this, this case of David Baltimore was, a, was a really the, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, after that, several other investigators were pulled an NIH fund from uh, misleading companies. So I think the, the, the lead is really a personal profit that's really not. Uh, of this idealistic, fantastic... Uh, well, why, why does everyone... Depends where you are. It depends on where you are. Well, you know. Okay, now we are looking at the perspective... What do you mean, where you are? In a research organization like this, uh, it's not only the personal profit, it's also the results and how you can apply those results to yeah, the yeah, mandate yeah. of the SDG. That, that's what I'm saying. But since, but, you know, I was just uh, uh, talking about the examples that were brought, which actually one of, of this... Uh, Sorry, but David Baltimore. <laughs> I, I didn't know that so David. You shot yourself in the foot. <laughs> I didn't know that David Baltimore was involved in something yeah, controversial yeah. like that. Oh, look, there are examples of this in Australia. There was a um, the the. Was he? No. Uh, yeah, you had to go. You had to, you had to resign from a, from a, a place of the nation. But look, I. Look, I'll tell you about another controversy. The, 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 the scientists that discovered that there was a, a connection between formidamide and birth defects and, uh, was an Australian scientist. And on the basis of, of that outcome, he, of that discovery, he set up an institution called the Foundation 41 to do research into birth, 41 weeks of gestation period. And he, because of a very high profile that he had, he attracted a lot of public donation of money. And 
he was discredited. He was discredited because even though that science that he did in relation to familial, the connection between familiamide and uh, birth defects was all quite correct, um, his uh, uh, objective in uh, continuing his foundation and keeping everyone employed in his foundation uh, meant that uh, out research outcomes were falsified. Data was falsified. And he was disgraced um, and his personal reputation was shattered. That of many people and colleagues in the institution was shattered because they colluded in that fraud. And it was scientific fraud and it was a very sad thing to happen. But as sad as that was, it doesn't change it doesn't change some fundamental things. The fundamental things it doesn't change is that good science um, is done by most people for reasons that are more altruistic than just uh, increasing the share price. They may be, at the end of the day, people who work for Pfizer, Merck, GSK, what, Abbott, whatever, yeah, they're doing their job. Um, they're going to make money. People, people who invest in the... <laughs> the point is that uh, uh, one should be aware that it in, in, in this, you gave a very positive view. At the beginning, I thought that was maybe you gave a view about another planet, you know. It's a, but on planet Earth, I think, uh, I, I feel that I had a lot of problems with, uh, with some companies, for instance, of course, with other superstar scientists, as you said. But I always felt that I was. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, going against their interest in proposing things. And so this this view that the scientists always heard uh, it doesn't coincide with my experience. But that, but, but that, does, that does, means, surely that means no more than raising to the challenge, doesn't it? Simply because really? raising to the challenge. If people in a company act in a selfish way, act in a way that is not consistent with some of these other objectives that we've been talking about, then uh, you, 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 you have two choices. You can either choose not to deal with them, and in which case um, the outcomes of the research may do nothing more than just be a good publication, nothing more than that. Alternatively, you can choose to deal with them, choose to keep them honest, choose to negotiate outcomes with them that are beneficial, because at the end of the day, companies need the science. And at the end of the day, the more important the science, the more critical the science is to the companies, the easier it is to make them bend. On some deals that I do, we have a very strong bargaining position to make companies more bend more than they may otherwise be prepared to. Then again, I do deals sometimes, we don't have a lot of room to bend, and therefore we have to compromise much more than on other occasions. But this is what commercial negotiations are about. But commercial negotiations are still done. They're done because if you don't have commercial negotiations, the research is just research. It never. Bad, right? Well, I think so. Looking just at things just for knowing them is bad. You think? No, 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 no. I think, I think. I mean, we are getting into the controversial area. I'll tell you what no, I think. No, no. I'll tell you. No, no, no. I'll tell you what I think. Research. I mean, just knowing new things. I thought it was the number one uh, line that you put. No, in. I think there's there's there's, there's there's a couple of in ways. Of knowledge. There's a, there's a couple of ways of answering that. I mean, sometimes increasing the boundaries of knowledge is good in itself because it becomes a platform for others to do other things. But I, I don't think any of these things necessarily has a one single right answer. I think that there are multiple f answers, multiple facets, multiple complexions on almost ever all the things that we're talking about. Um, I, don't, I, don't think it's, I don't think it necessarily is the case that you say you just do research, that's it, nothing else. Because I think the commercialization objective is a legitimate objective. Sure. And that's really all I'm proposing. I think, I think I mean, in other words, we never, never, never finish unless I give going. Just give <laughs> an example. Philip is now helping us to commercialize uh, a technology which may lead to a malaria vaccine. And I think that uh, if eventually a malaria vaccine gets out of the military component, I think that we have achieved uh, our mandate. So. The, some some sure, basic case. principles do exist, sure. otherwise we will be ending up uh, debating on the philosophy of science. And it, it, uh, it can become a philosophical de debate, can't we? There's only, there's only another couple of slides, and I notice the time. This has gone much longer than, than I, I thought it was going to, and you're all probably hungry, so I'll finish these slides very quickly, because there really only are two left, I think. 
The third, the third comment was uh, starting the work before the contract is signed. And I, could, I had a repertoire of stories that I could tell you, but having regard to the time, I think I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll save you those. Um, other than to just simply make the point, sometimes a substantial amount of money and resources can be expended. Sometimes even expensive capital equipment is bought all on the expectation that a contract is going to be signed. If it's not signed, that money is wasted. Um, it's hard to get it back. It's hard to recoup it. And the other terrible thing that it does is it weakens the bargaining position enormously. Um, so a contract should always be signed before work is started. Work, work should not start. As I say, and I won't, I won't go take you through some of the, w w the stories that I could. Finishing off on managing publications. Um, it's not a case of these things being on a collision course as we've been talking about. All, all these objectives are legitimate to the scientists, the peer recognition, career advancement. To the companies, to earn a profit, that's legitimate as well. To the community, um, the benefits of research being beneficial. Uh, that means people need to work together. Scientists and business managers need to work together to ensure that publications are managed in a way that neither that they are not prevented, but also that they don't prevent commercialisation taking place. That means people just need to talk to one another, give a few months' notice of their intention to present a paper or submit an abstract or whatever it is, even the possibility of amending a publication. I will tell you one story. One scientist who um, had a publication who, which uh, there was some uncertainty about whether it was a good idea or not to publish it. And the company, and this was, I'll tell you who it was, it was, it was Pfizer. We went to Pfizer. Pfizer had the one, uh, was the company funding this research. So we gave them the publication and asked them for their views. And uh, Pfizer also was concerned that the publication, if it was to proceed, could be prejudicial to the patenting strategy. So called a meeting, gave it all to patent attorneys to look at, called a meeting, everyone sat around evaluating this and coming to a shared view as to what the best outcome was. Patent attorney's advice was that in the context of the strategy, the patent strategy that was in place and had been in place for some time, and a strategy that was expected to be implemented over a period of time, the patent attorney's recommendation was that the publication proceed with one paragraph omitted. And everyone took a breath and thought, uh-oh, what's the scientist going to say? Everyone turned their head to the scientist to see what his reaction to the omission of this critical paragraph would be. The scientist, you can see his mind thinking, the scientist said, all right, we can take that paragraph out, this publication can proceed, and then in nine months' time, I can present a paper at this meeting and present another publication. He got two publications out of it instead of one. That was the outcome. That's when these things work at their best. They work at their best when both the company and the scientist are sympathetic to each other's needs. And because they're sympathetic to each other's needs, they work together for this for these objectives to be achieved, rather than the company saying no or vetoing, which is unacceptable. And rather than a scientist saying, I must be able to publish without any uh, restraint, that's unacceptable as well. Working together, and it can happen, it does happen, I see it happen all the time. I see it, I, I, in fact, to be honest, I, I, I do not see any anxiety about the timing of publications. The worst that I see happen is that people are asked to defer their publication to a later time. And sometimes it's the scientist who is the catalyst for that. It's a scientist who is saying the best timing for the publication is this. Anyway, that's just a, com a comment. At the end of the day, uh, for me, this is a personal view, when Ian Fraser got up recently at a, um, at a conference and he announced that 400 million women, or well, 600 million women had been vaccinated, and a certain percentage of those women in the world are not going to die from cervical cancer it makes me feel good. And people that I work with and people that I know uh, who also commercialise, when we get together and when we chat about the things that we do, the things that makes us uh, like our jobs, apart from the fact that we earn a living, the thing that makes us like our jobs is that uh, we make a small contribution towards these sorts of objectives. 
That's why we do it. Thank you for coming.